Good morning, everyone, and we welcome you to our Saturday morning Bible study. This is Saturday, February 11, 2017, and we are recording from Plainfield, New Jersey, in the United States of America. And this morning, Jeremy from New Jersey is our moderator. Thank you. Our quote this morning is from Miscellaneous Writings by Mary Baker Eddy. The material record of the Bible, Mrs. Eddy said, is no more important to our well-being than the history of Europe and America. But the spiritual application bears upon our eternal life. The method of Jesus was purely metaphysical, and no other method is Christian science. Thank you. Thank you. Good one. Well, thank you, Mary, because you told me to use it. Oh, <laughs> 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 well, some time ago, actually. <clears throat> so our topic today is No Prophet Under the Sun, and the Bible readings are from Ecclesiastes 1 and 2. The first question is, who was the preacher? Well, that would, that would be Solomon, the son of David. was king of Israel for many, many years. Right. Forty, I think. Yeah, what do we know about him? Well, what are some of the reasons why we think it's Solomon? Because he, because he says he is. <laughs> well, well, not exactly. But no. Or maybe only if, one of David's sons that actually served as king in Jerusalem. Well, another interesting question might be, why, why does he refer to himself as preacher instead of king? I thought it was because of teacher, going to teach us. Why? Because he learned a very hard lesson and probably didn't want well, and he was worried about the future, all he did, and then who was it going to go to? He was very concerned about that. Did you want to say anything more, Tom, about why why we think it's Solomon? Or, no? no, that's fine. But, you know, I think um, my, my, my feeling on why he called himself a preacher is because this was a book that he didn't write early in his life. He wrote late in his life. So he had been king for a long time and done a lot of things and um, you know now he's reflecting on his life and it's interesting he's not looking to himself as being you know a monarch or a king of a nation he's looking to himself as a preacher yeah he had he he started out with a lot going for him and he strayed he made a lot of big mistakes. He screwed up a few things pretty badly. And he's sorry about that. And he, in a way, he's warning the rest of us not to stray. Yeah, I mean, what do we know about him? What he started out, well, he, he's King David's son, which is, and, and so what, and what did he ask God for? Wisdom. God was pleased. That's a very good thing to ask God for, wisdom. And he got wisdom. And he, he, in many ways, maintained some portion of that wisdom throughout his life. But, so that, but then what happened? Well, he did a lot of, he did a lot of stuff. I mean, he built the temple. He had hundreds of wives. You know? He had all those strange women. Right. 300 concubines. <laughs> he had everything under the sun. And everything you know, under gold and all the delkies, the food that he wanted, servants, and everything he wanted. Built houses, 
gardens for all his wives. Built a fleet of ships. Brought in tons of gold. He financed a whole bunch of idols for some of his wives. And taxed the daylights out of the people. Yeah, what did and what does what do they attribute his his downfall to? His strange wives. Yeah, his strange wives. And why was that? They were idol worshippers. Yes. Well, he lost his humility. Thought it was okay to collect all kinds of stuff. He certainly went into excess. We read yesterday about, or last week, about the temple that he built. I mean, it was monstrous. Gold plated, marble, it was a fortress. And he charged uh, people so much money, I mean, that uh, some of the tribes left and went to Egypt. Well, yeah, I mean, there had to have been some way. Taxes. Taxes, yes, that's always. It was the beginning of the split of the of the two, of Israel, you know, and the lost tribes. There's a reason way back in the time of Moses that he said, don't take on the women of the other tribes. And it wasn't so much literally the persons or whatever, but it was their way of thinking. Instruction is to protect your thinking. Otherwise, you take on what else is going on and you pollute the pure sense of things. And it's in the taken mind. I mean, here's, a, here's Solomon, he married all these women. No doubt he was influenced by their customs. And it was a compromise for what he had started out with his pure sense of good. in a good place. Of course, we don't have that problem today as a nation. Well, and you know, as a, as a scientist, you have to be aware and careful of who you marry. They'll either take you closer to God or farther from it. it doesn't mean you necessarily have to marry Christian scientists. There's so few around anyway, and some of them don't really know what that word means, but... Most of them don't. Yeah, most of them don't. So, but you need to, um, uh, as Mrs. Evans said when she met her husband, he wasn't a Christian scientist, but she saw a soul in his eyes, and he became a Christian scientist. Because if you don't, um, well, what will happen when you marry someone who, especially someone who is opposed to it? Well, the same thing that happened to Solomon, you'll just be go away from God. Yeah, you'll start making compromises. You get pulled away. Maybe your children don't even know you are a Christian scientist. Um, it, it can be not a good thing. Uh, if you if you hold the line and and you do as as Mrs. Evans did and bring your spouse into science is one thing, but many don't. They just don't. They don't even expect to. She said she would see her husband in church, and not only did he become a Christian scientist, he became a practitioner. Well, that, that is the attitude you should have, because otherwise you will be pulled away. I mean, we, we know, I've, I've told this story of someone who... Um, well, her parents, one was a Christian scientist, one the mother wasn't. The father adored the 
mother, I guess they were Episcopalian, so he always went to her church, he always did all of this stuff, and the daughter never even knew much about science or that he was a scientist. And later, she had a lot of difficulties in life that she could have been spared of in talking to her. She wished her father had told her. But it, it's what happened. And it seems so dogmatic and tough and all of that, but who you marry is, is very important. They say it's one of the most important decisions you make. And only God can tell you who and what, but always a criteria is, is it going to bring you closer to God or not? So many of you are already involved in all kinds of marriages or relationships and kind of late, but you can still <laughs> hold your own. And I had a brother who married someone who was totally non-interested in, in Christian science, and at first he was just starry-eyed and loved her and it didn't seem to matter, but after years of that, it did matter. He ended up divorcing her because he, he was tired of, of having that opposition in his home all the time. I remember one of my Please first, uh, I, I remember one of my first sessions at the uh, playing field where complained about my wife, and uh, two couple of options were given. One was divorce and one was conversion. And uh, after having studied Christian science for about 10 years, I can tell you from the time being at Plainfield that there has been a huge shift. And the opposition, the absolute opposition, has pretty much crumbled and... Uh, and discuss God now, which is absolutely euphoric for me, I would say. <laughs> and I am just so grateful for the teachings here and the correct science <clears throat> can always be the winner as long as one holds one's line. And uh, so that's a very important thing that you're saying. That's Thank a you wonderful. Thank you, Mike. That's a wonderful testimony. And that's living it. Mrs. Eddy says, what does she say in the chapter of marriage about if one person in the marriage is what? It's better than the other. Right. And if one is a Christian scientist, there should never be any reason for divorce. Why? Because if you're proving it in your life, it can change. And trusting God and living it, truly living it from your heart, seeing God in yourself and the other party. It takes yes. time, it's difficult, but yes, God is here and He is yes. the one that everyone reflects. So, Because your spouse is in your thought. That's where the dominion is. It's not someone over there who's misbehaving badly. He or she is in your thought, just as Gary gave a story, and it's in that article, Oneness. Almost about the. Oh, about the. Uh woman whose husband was still smoking. She complained to Mrs. Eddie about her husband still smoking, and her Mrs. Eddie said, my dear, haven't you been healed of smoking yet? Because it, it's, in, it's in your thinking, you know, and especially when you live with someone for a long time, you expect certain types of behavior from them. You think they'll never change. You expect them to be you know, unhelpful or dirty or whatever it is that you don't like about them or oppose you, your religion. So you expect it. Your expectation isn't from the Lord anymore. You just expect it and you end up getting it. And it takes work to turn that around and realize what are you expecting? What are you thinking? What are you seeing in your household? It used, to drive, it used to drive Mrs. Evans crazy because she saw in the church church would be full of little old ladies with husbands who never came to church. It can be the other way, too, with husbands whose wives never come to church. And and she would see it as a toxic relationship. The, the, the husbands usually mock the religion. The, the woman would resent the husband. There was They got where there was really no real love in the relationship. And uh, 
you know, she, she they would come to her for help, and there would be so many of them. And that does not have to be, not if you are a practicing scientist. Go ahead, Florence. No, I'm just going to say in those, you know, sayings about, oh, men are like this or women are like that, all that we have to watch because this is mortal mind. That's what it likes. It, then it will paint pictures for you that horrible pictures that uh, you can hold attached to someone. And um, only God can save all this. And I know only through Christian science and the understanding of who the real man is, it's what says that's it. It's what says. And and certainly in some instances there are situations when you've done everything you can, as Jeremy has said, he did everything he could and then what? I, I don't feel bad now. <laughs> that's over. Yeah. You know? I, I kind of think that's where Solomon was, you know. Did everything he could in that one direction, and then he realized it was no good, so he left the record. Go try it, you know. <laughs> I have to. Sorry, go ahead. I just have to say, in a lot of ways, this Ecclesiastes is very sad, but there's some profound lessons in here, and one of them is this verse um, 15: that which is crooked cannot be made straight. Yeah. He obviously came to a realization instead of compromising and trying to make people happy. Hey, if it's wrong, it's wrong. Tell it like it is. And then you do have to separate. So uh, divorce or separation, we're not saying that's necessarily bad. If you can't, if you've done everything you can to try to redeem or save the situation and it's not working, then it's time to separate. That's all right. But... I'm just making a point here because that was Solomon's demise was living with with, he, with women who had other gods and he didn't challenge it. He just went along with it. And it, it's poisonous. Poisonous. Unless you stand up to an era, you get dragged down in it. And many people don't know this. Uh, and many even scientists have never been taught this. But we certainly have been here. And you can read all that Mrs. Eddy has said about marriage in in Science and Health and also in Prose Work. And eventually, what are we told? Heaven what? Not only given in marriage. Right. We neither marry nor given in marriage. So it, it, in heaven. It's a somewhat of a human institution. Yeah. How do we look at Jesus' commandment in the in uh, the Sermon on the Mount when he says, I say to you that whosoever shall put away his wife, save for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery? Well, yeah. well what do you think? Listen. Well, how does that apply to you? Well, I'm not involved in the war. For it. Can I? Uh, but, I but first, first I want to say is that what Mrs. Singletary said totally was my marriage. But the thing is, is that that was one of the reasons I came into Christian Science was to save my marriage, huh. our marriage. The other thing, though, is, is that I read <clears throat> marriage many times, and it would help at the moment or whatever, but I could never control my emotions thereafter. So it's the simple ABCs taught here that really help. And I think one has to distinguish between if one did divorce, <clears throat> which was pre-Christian science or in the jam, which is Christian science versus when one is a Christian scientist, because I think once one is a true Christian scientist, then it isn't an issue, because then it will come to fruition and be um, understood as uh, Solomon did in his later life, the transgressions that he had made, the mistakes he had made, and God always forgives those who repent and calls everybody to repentance. And, right. Uh, and the starry-eyed part 
is not anywhere as near as much fun as this part, let me tell you, from experience. Thank you. <laughs> and as far as is is Fairly's question, I you know, that's I, to me it's an individual working out. You have to do what your nearest sense of right in various situations and we don't judge other people. So um you can take that literally if you want to. However, whatever. I mean the rules of marriage certainly have relaxed greatly and now so many people live together and are not married. So it's you know, changed. I mean, I, I was taught, my mother taught me, and, and she wasn't a Christian scientist, but she said, all, all of this sex before marriage, well, she said if you have sex before marriage, it's committing adultery, because eventually those people, <laughs> you'll be married, they'll be married, and, and anyway, that's how she looked on it, and that's how she taught me. So it was, certain things were verboten. But now, everything is so relaxed, and I'm not here to preach or to tell anybody what they have to do. Just turning you to God and to make you think a little more deeply about it. And those people who don't know the chapter in marriage should study it and listen to Florence reading it. Um, someone had implied recently that it's kind of too old-fashioned to apply today, but I, I disagree with that. It's not. She says chastity is the cement of civilization. And that never grows old. That what, never grows old. What's old fashioned about that? What is yeah. old fashioned? What? 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 Did they say what is old fashioned about the chapter? Oh, well, that perhaps because of all this, you know, free love and and all all of that. Forget uh, what other references. Free um, love certainly isn't free for well, anyone. Yeah, but look at the hell that it brings, living loosely. Right. I mean... <laughs> well, that's the point. It, it's not, yeah, her chapter on marriage is never outdated. Uh -huh. There are principles there that will live forever. But regarding, you know, marriage and, you know, no, no marriage that I've ever seen has ever been a cakewalk. <laughs> I mean, but um, what, what Mary has been saying is that when you've got work to do for God, when you're a serious student of Christian science, and you, and you get on this path where you're seriously wanting to do what God wants you to do, because you recognize that that's the only road to happiness, then Christian science heals. It heals whatever comes to you. And whenever you find yourself in a contrary kind of situation, your desire should be, God, heal it or remove it, because I have work to do. Back on the free love part, and what I've told my daughter from experience and uh, never occurred to me how that kind of thing would affect when I did have children because I never thought I'd ever have children. <laughs> so. Yeah. And with your children, you do the best you can with them now today with all this new morality, so-called new morality going on. But teach them. You can certainly speak your mind as to how you feel and, and only allow, you certainly don't allow things in your home if it's against your principles, you just don't allow it. And I, oh, my, my brother, years ago, he told me to work with the definitions of bride and bridegroom in science and health. They are very powerful in the glossary. And he said when he did that, you know, his daughter met someone very wonderful that she married. And, uh, you know, work with that doesn't matter if you have children or not have children or how old your children are. Um, working with that can attract right people into their lives. Definition of bride and bridegroom deals with purity. And it also deals with, we're going to get into this too, with the, the right attraction. So uh, all of this goes along with life being 
all is vanity and vexation of spirit. And certainly, an unhappy or unfulfilling marriage is that. And as we talked about, this is largely what led Solomon astray. Not entirely, but had a good deal to do with it. Once you get into other gods, you're cooked. And and by other gods, that doesn't mean some, you know, statue that you're worshipping. Other gods is, uh, you know, a spouse who's absolutely into materia medica, into higher education or the intellect or, I don't know, there are all kinds of things now that are other gods that are anti-science or into their own religion, whatever that might be. And and if if they don't respect what you're doing, well, then you're in trouble. That's when you got to fight back. Respect is essential. You can't have a marriage and you can't love someone if there's not respect. But do you dis do you deserve the respect? And are you seeing them as God's child, or are you seeing them as something else? You've got to be living your science. And when you do that, all things are possible to him, to God. Okay. I would like to um, add something before we move on, if I can. As two things, actually. I just wanted to address the free love real quick. That was in, also showed up in Mrs. Eddy's time, and she addressed it. And actually behind it was the anarchist movement, for anyone who's interested. And Thank then, you. But yes, so it's nothing new, and there's people behind it. Right. And the, the other thing I wanted to add, I wanted to thank Jeremy for this, these questions, because well, the first thing I read in the commentary was that Ecclesiastes was not about the existence of God, but that whether or not God matters and living a life without God in the forefront. And that is such a big deal that people just live so casually as if God um, does, it doesn't really matter whether you worship or not. And it's, I don't know how to describe it, but it's very pervasive, and especially in when I found in the movement when I was uh, like living this whole life free-wheeling it, uh, thinking that it really wasn't a big deal whether you were respectful to God or not. And I, I think this is a very profound Bible study. Thank you. And yes, and in, in this chapter I read, and I didn't realize this, but a lot of people don't like this chapter, Ecclesiastes, because they say it's so pessimistic and dark and down, <laughs> all this, how miserable life is. But it's not, because without God, life is miserable. And I know I could identify with it if you understand the right sense of it. And also about this free love thing, yes, that's why she says chastity is the cement of civilization. Because when you break down the family unit, what happens? That's a ripple effect. Yeah. I mean, you look at these children born without any kind of normal life, without a father or a mother or both. See what happens. It's, it's a breakdown. And then pretty soon, other people are raising them like ISIS, <laughs> or worse, or better. But anyway, it's it's not good. And it will lead to a, a lot of problems. Many people feel that's the, the core, the root core of why we have a lot of problems. It's the breakdown of the family. Children who never know about God or the Bible, who've never been taught how to behave or any morals in their life. So they don't know who to trust. They don't know who to trust, or they, you know, they look to a gang member for their advice. They don't know why to be good either. Yeah, right. no one was ever good to them. Uh, having been through two divorces, I did I did pray about that a lot after coming here. And one thing I realized is that adultery is not just cheating on your spouse. It's, adultery is really, you know, like the perversion of truth and love. And nobody's purpose in life is, is to have sex in any manner, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's I don't know, that was something that helped me, this whole free love thing and all that. It's getting people away from what their real purpose in life is. 
why why we're here. That's absolutely right. Being on children, if they have a, a stable home environment, they're very secure and happy. But if the home environment is unstable, then they feel the discontent, and the discontent just continues and escalates into other things. And I just wanted to read this one thing from Ecclesiastes where it says, all rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. So if you're trying to satisfy sense or selfishness, it's a continual thing that will never be satisfied. That sea or whatever sense of contentment will never get there. It's, it's endless. Yes. And, and there are many single, either mothers or fathers, who have raised exceptional children. So if you are divorced or a single parent, that doesn't mean you're destitute by any way, especially if you know that God is the father and mother of us all. And you hear these stories about children who were raised by a mother who worked from dawn to dusk and how much they loved her and admired her, and, and they end up doing tremendously well in their life because they had what's important, which is love, and in almost every case, too, a right sense of God. I also think um, raising up a child has so little to do with parents. Biological parents, um, because it doesn't really matter not who raised up a child. You know, there are children who are raised in a foster home, or who are raised in foster homes, and they turn out to become very, very useful to themselves and to the society. Because uh, raising up of a child has little to do with parents. If you have that child to understand that your real parent is God, it doesn't really matter what the environment is presented to them, that child or the children can also grow up to become very useful. Right, they're, they're, known, they're always, you know, every case is different. Every case is different. So that's why nothing is ever hopeless. And if children are, are taught good Christian principles and have a good sense, of what God is, or what it stands, you know, what God stands for, that's the way out of any pervert or, or difficult situation. It's, you know, and if the home has that sense of godliness in it, you're right. It doesn't matter whether there's one parent or two parents or, or foster, foster parents or, or whatever. whatever. But Christ so much. Loved. So many, so many, yeah. So many of these single parent homes, unfortunately, don't have that sense of God. But that's that's the issue. Yeah, it's even the Bible. I always refer to the Bible for um, as a lesson for this topic. Like uh, mostly, was given away by his parents. Turn out a good example, yeah. yeah. God's purpose in his life. Um, Samuel was also given away by his parents willingly to be raised by somebody else to go to their foster home for what God's plan. And he turned out to become one of the best or the finest teachers of the history of mankind. Um, thank you. Yeah, you're right, that is home. That home uh, represents God. Okay. Oh, I just wanted to say one other thing. I think I think he didn't use his name. I think he used the preacher because then he goes on to talk about vanity. So I figured <laughs> one more thing. I just won't use my name on it. So, um, <laughs> uh -huh. Not to be vain about it. Huh? Right. Um. Question number two. What did he accomplish? I know we spoke about this a little bit, so there's more. Well, he, he went out to seek every single thing, everything that anybody could ever want materially, right? Vineyards, homes, women, 
He said he increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Yes. Knowledge. Also, my wisdom remained with me. This is more, what didn't he accomplish as far as material life is concerned? Well, he, he accomplished a lot humanly. Yeah. He, he, you know, he built this huge, huge temple people to worship God because he had a sense of God. He had strong wisdom. But, you know, he... He obviously lost humility along the way. Well, he, he got had, totally he had, involved with the thing. And it's a wonderful example for people who think that they don't have some things. Because he had everything. And he still was miserable. They took the place of God and there was no satisfaction in them. Right. I read that all men get by labor will not supply the wants of the soul, nor hinder the loss of it. So the material means nothing. Yeah. I think that's the next question. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because what you said before, Mary, about a lot of people today rejecting this chapter of the Bible. For me, I think it's probably one of the most significant chapters in the Bible because um, it's actually the present day situation. You have to see it that way. I mean, people don't want to see it that way because it's a true picture of what's happening today. How it is. So much is put in, into material things, and life is going into God. And that's exactly what the child is talking about. We work so hard, but well, how many times are we working hard for the glory of God? Who knew? What should I ask? Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good point. I mean, what have we accomplished? You know, we've sent people to the moon, we've built all these ships, we've built all these really huge, tall buildings. Yeah, we're talking as a nation. driving around in New England, Tom. Um, that's what you mean. What? Yes, me? Yeah, I'm asking you. You had told me when you were up in New England and driving around that all that so many churches were empty. Right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I was a little surprised at uh, that, but go ahead. Well, I just saw that in Wales, too. I mean, Wales is a country known for uh, for having churches, and also famous for having choirs. So every town had a church, every, every church had a choir. So it's kind of like a singing nation. Um, but... Uh, most of the churches in the towns, um, what I saw, were, were abandoned, locked up, actually. Doors were chained with padlocks. That was true. I mentioned we went on a train ride through France. The country outside of France. France, yeah. yeah. And we saw all these churches. and Every village had a church. Every village had a people. church, but 
Suzanne, who spent a lot of time living in Paris and in France, said that those churches are locked up too, except for maybe a wedding or some special event. A lot of that is rejection of Catholicism. Um, uh, churches or religions that have no meaning, people reject, and they should. But it needs to be replaced with something, or there's a huge void. And when there's a huge void, uh, the Antichrist will come in. I think that is true, so, so true in Europe right now, because all those big churches take a lot of taxes, but nobody attends these big churches. They are so tall, they wanted to build at one time, and they started in the 1200s and built these churches. They wanted to get closer to God, and they thought <laughs> that the higher they built, they would be closer to God. And now nobody attends these churches. It's just visitors, you know. Right. And they have uh, for this, uh, like, a uh, Cologne church, Oh, that must be supposed to be the biggest. And there's a lot of size, seismology going on under there. As there's a lot of earthquakes and things. And they have four people that just crack, that check every crack in that church. Okay. And, and it's, it's just unbelievable, you know. It's, <laughs> it's just really not religion at all. It's just, you know, admiring the buildings. Benjamin just sent me or gave me a letter from someone who wrote us from Switzerland saying that uh, society was shut down. Fewer or less members were meeting one day for three hours in a year. Wow. In We are meeting one day for three hours in a year until 2025. Anyway, that's Switzerland. That's, that's all of, of, of Europe, really. So, well, okay. Vanity and vexation of spirit. Go ahead. Question number three. Why did all of that end up? Vanity and vexation of spirit. That word vanity means meaningless, waste of time, hopeless, fruitless, pride. Vexation is agitating the mind, distressing, full of trouble. State of depression. He had available to him as king all the best that the world had to offer, and none of it satisfied him. He ended up worshiping the objects that he collected more than he worshiped the love of God that they represented. Those objects did not satisfy him. <laughs> and they never do. They never, they can't. It's impossible. He, he, makes, he, he makes so much of Valentine's Day and, and you just have to know it's not presents but love. And it, it, it's just all about... Uh, right, and human love is not love. The yeah. highest sense of okay. love. Yeah, that's why we have to replace it. Replace it, not go along with it, but replace it with a spiritual sense of love. Matthew Henry said, happiness is not the good we must have, but the good we must do. While we while we are in this world, while it is day. Thank you. That's good. Solomon was sort of looking for love in all the wrong places, like the song says. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. the vanity of what came after him. Yeah, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? You know, in, in um, that second chapter, I keep looking at verse 9 and 10 where it says, So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine eye desired, I kept not from them, withheld not my heart from my joy, 
For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. And then one day he looks at it and says, I, Then I looked at all the works that my hand had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, this was vanity and vexation of spirit. And there was no prophet under the sun. And he, it, 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 that's where he, he finally realized. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and that really wasn't wisdom, was it? To 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 indulge everything that he thought he might want. Yeah. I mean, he really got off the track with wisdom because <laughs> that was not wisdom. But he got too full of himself. Maybe all that human knowledge too. So, and how many people? How many? Do you know, really, you know, with that same poor little rich girl, all these people who seem to have so much and are so miserable, so it certainly isn't what brings you happiness. So what does? The lesson tells us what does. What does? I love the God and riches toward God. Go ahead, Jeff. I think it was... If Solomon began on the right track and he got off the track, I think it was his prayer in the beginning, and it certainly helped me in the over the years. He prayed for an understanding heart that I might discern between between good and evil. Wasn't that Solomon's prayer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was a, that, that was an honest and a pure desire. And but. It became corrupted, I guess. Yeah. The greed and uh, trying to keep all those lies. Control, I don't know. He ended up wanting the things. Mrs. Eddy says, security for the claims of harmonious and eternal being is found only in divine science. I love that. Yes. What's the correlative statement in the Bible in the, in the lesson? But rather, <laughs> seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Seek God first. You'll never want for anything. And you'll have a great joy. You know, this, this idea, all these people turning to drugs, I mean, that's all this vanity and vexation of spirit. Free love vanity and vexation of spirit. You're looking for God in the wrong places. If you have a right sense of who and what you are and, and who God is, you won't be tempted by those things. But it's in seeking them. And when children aren't raised to know anything about God at all, maybe all they're raised is, is to get into the best schools or you know, wear the right clothes or I don't know what else, play tennis and do all this kind of thing. But their their spiritual nature has been totally ignored. Is it any wonder? Is it any wonder that they're crying out for something more and that they're seeking it somewhere? Also, if they have their parents as an example, they often hear the parents have as much drugs and everything else as the children. what it all leads to. It, it, you know, that saying is that Emerson or one of them, that people lead lives of quiet desperation. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Lives of quiet desperation. I led a life of quiet desperation. Fortunately, I knew enough not to turn to drugs, but a lot of people don't. Day after day of feeling depressed. I feel growing up too, you know, always seeing um, like the the means for relief of any trouble is to go to you know go to the doctor, get the you know, pill or something. That's what you see. So it's it's not surprising that people think as they grow up that oh well maybe I'll take this pill and then it will lead to the other pill and the higher they go into the drugs. Absolutely, that's so true. Thank you. 
They see it as, a, as from an early child. The minute you have any trouble, you, you get taken to the doctor. Get some pill to relieve it. Going to the doctor becomes a way of life. You spend more time with the doctor than you do in prayer or knowing God. And then there are other ways that people, quote, medicate themselves or deal with their issues. Some people go to the gym and work themselves to death in the gym. <laughs> or work themselves to death in the office. That's a wonderful point because one of the things with Solomon was that he used a, a lot of slave labor or maybe we don't know what was paid to these people, but it makes me think that so many times what we're having our children do, whether it's high marks or being a wonderful expert in sports, is uh, really for us, not for the children. So in a way, we're enslaving them to these uh, our needs. Right. That's mm -hmm. true. Yeah. We want it for our own pride. Yeah, you know, it's like children engaged in like maybe three different extra, you know, after school programs, and they have to do this, and they have. It's none of this really amounts to anything. No, and no, no time to think. No time that you just keep keep them busy. Children should be allowed to be children. And, ma and make good grades so you can get into a good college. That's it. And mm -hmm. heaven forbid if you don't, you'll be a disgrace to the family. Right. I, I find it so refreshing when I see children disgracing their parents. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> well, because it's so humbling. And most people need that. And I know I did, and I had my share of it. And, it, and sometimes, you know, you just <laughs> you just can't hide it, what your children are doing. <laughs> so take that little potion of humble pie and realize maybe you weren't so great after all, and maybe what you wanted for them wasn't so great. Maybe you better reconsider your what's important in life. Solomon uh, also was worried about this too because he had children. And he had knew. tons of children. <laughs> yeah, he had a lot of children. No, no. That's not why he was worried because he was, you know, he had all this wealth. Power. He realized what a terrible legacy he was going to leave, yeah. and this was why he gave this. And he, he, he said something here. He said, um, Yeah, I hid it all my level which I have taken under this act because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. Right. One of his children. That he read that. Yeah. Uh, so she did, yeah. yeah. But what I was saying is that and he said, I, the point I was gonna make is and who knows whether he shall be a wise man or a fool. <laughs> that's that's right. what people are worried today. When they look at their children, is he going to turn out to be like me? Or is he going to turn out to be something else? And for that, we do so much to try to change who that child is or what God wants that child to In many cases, that child is not. It's not do what you want it because it's too much investment to put in that child. Right. Which in is why. Way, not in the which is why the only thing of value we can give our children is a is a connection with God. And if you haven't done that, you've really you've done nothing again. You've, you've given them nothing you've of value. You've given them nothing. What are they going to do later on when with trouble? They'll turn to the drugs and everything else if they haven't already. That's why in our recent whatever Bible study we had recently a couple of weeks ago where the whole thing was tr teach your children. Write it on your forehead. Story of Abraham Lincoln's mother. Teach it to your children. It has far-reaching benefits and effects. And that can be whether they go to church or not. I don't know if Abraham Lincoln went to church much, but his mother, as a child, taught him the Beatitudes, the commandments. He read the Bible, and it stayed with him. The truth. The best inheritance, right? The best. 
said, never too late, never too late. And as we know, we can't preach to anybody, especially to the children, because they can't stand it. Right, especially after they're 10 or 12 years old. Yeah, you, you have to do it by example, show them by example. You speak from your own heart, and heart reaches heart. So, after all he did, he realized he was totally miserable and unfulfilled. Also, of course, what he did was totally selfish, all selfish, all about himself. How could that be happy? The other element of vanity, one is worthless, and the other is pointing right to yourself only. Yes, it's all about you, you, you. In one of our recent Bible studies, we were, sp we were instructed by Christ Jesus to go and go out into all the world and spread the gospel. And in one of the commentaries, it stated that if we didn't do this, we were actually robbing people of their lives. And it was so startling to me. And I thought, well, you know, how do you go out and preach the gospel? But it's living the truth that you know and just asking God moment by moment. And that was... That was a good thing, I thought. It was very good. It's like what Sharon has talked about some of her testimonies where she's you know, figured something out, prayed about it, figured it out, and then, but then she lets her boss or anybody know that she'd been praying. She didn't take all the credit herself. She knew it was God working. That's how you share it, and that's keeping your humility. It's most important. I remember when I was growing up, um, I wasn't growing up in a wonderful environment. My neighborhood wasn't that good. But there are so many things I wanted to do, like play sports like every other kid. I, I never see my mom actually encourage me to go and play sports. I don't know if she loves it or not, but sometimes she shows interest in that. But she made me go to Sunday school. That one she had to. <laughs> Yeah, that was you have to drag me, sometimes punish me, and deny me something. <laughs> that gets I, a standing ovation. <laughs> uh, she had her priorities right. She had her priorities. <laughs> yeah. Growing up, it was hard for me to take as a kid. Um, because I wanted to do the other thing. But that time, I didn't know why she was doing it until I grew up, honestly. And it was not that I grew up, I didn't know why she was doing it. Maybe if she had pushed me to go and play sports, that's a chance I won't be here. And Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Question about that. That is so excellent, Benjamin. You write an article on that because that's exactly what parents do. You're going to be the best tennis player. You're going to be this. You're going to be that. Mm -hmm. You spend Sunday morning doing this. Nobody takes their kids to church. I won't say nobody, but that. And, and, and so the child protests. So what? You take them anyway. We, this is what we did in our church. Our kids came to church. As long as they were in your home, they came to church. Now, again, everybody, I'm not preaching this to anybody. You've got to work it out, your own salvation. And a lot of you don't have churches necessarily to go to except us, and we're always glad to have everybody. But that is, you see, and you see, Benjamin has this great sense of God and Christianity that his mother instilled. And yeah, sometimes kids don't want to do it, but that doesn't mean you just go around and just say, oh, well, they have to decide for themselves. And I'm not going to push myself on them and let them go to hell. Because they will, unless <laughs> you're not careful. It's like living that the, the God doesn't matter, living a life where God doesn't matter. What's the big uh, deal? Go to church, don't go to church. Well, it does matter. It does matter. Exactly right. And if they don't want to, well, that's, you just bring them along anyway. I mean, we brought our kids screaming sometimes, and and they had the schools had all this stuff going on Sunday mornings, and they they were not allowed to participate. They had to come to church. Period. That went on till they were adults, and when they were on their own. There was no question in my home. We had to go. Period. Oh. Period. Right. Period. Yep. Yeah. No, you won't. You're not going to say anything. You're going. That's, That's it. it. It's, it's non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. 
but we all tiptoe around our children now. They have to, they're these little gods. If you want to know little gods? Those are little gods. Whatever, oh, yep, and if they don't like Sunday school, oh my gosh, there must be something really wrong with it. Nope, we're not going. All of this kind of thing, you tiptoe around. Thank you, Benjamin, and thank your mother. So, okay, let's just quickly do the last question. What did he mean that there was no profit under the sun? There was, there was no God in it. Yeah, and he he had experienced everything that the world had to offer and none of it mattered. No satisfaction, no security, no happiness. I read that the Hebrew meaning of meaningless is breath and that surprised me and it said all life is breathless without God, only God's word is worthwhile. That is beautiful. Thank you. Your, your breath is taken from you because it's, it's not life. I read it. It's to look at life, life's events from a carnal perspective, from the human mind. If you look at life from the human mind, it makes no sense and it is so depressing. You look at it as God's creation and with a divine spiritual understanding in your spiritual sense, everything becomes beautiful. Life is restored. Your breath is restored. What does Miss Patty call mortal existence? It's interesting, the end, the, the end of the book, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Yes. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's what he came to after all of this. And perhaps that's a good ending. We could talk for hours, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, he came to that. So, through all he went through. So we can thank Solomon for having that ounce of humility to warn us all not to do what he did. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> it really wasn't. Um, all, all those women wasn't all that great. <laughs>